This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try today for free. Visit digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code KNOWHOW in the billing section to get your $10 credit. And by Braintree. Mobile app development can be complex, but integrating your payments no longer has to be. With Braintree, your business can accept nearly every type of payments from any device with just one integration. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. Today on Know How, it's a gaming extravaganza. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to be showing you some of the things that we've been geeking out to so you can take them home and geek out on your own. Now, Brian, this is a slinky. Nothing to do with today's episode whatsoever. Oh. Not even a little bit. It's just here for fun. It's a prop, it's for it's... effect. Because instead, we're going to be talking about uh. something that we both really enjoy. Now I'm extremely disappointed that we're not talking about this. Oh, my goodness. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about gaming. That's yes. right. My other passion. Your other passion. Uh, <laughs> Aluminum tubes and gaming. Not only are we going to show you some of the latest technology that we found at the Augmented World Expo, not only do you have a thorough review of a gaming system that we've had mm -hmm. down in the no hole for a few months, but we've got Alan Malventano coming on to tell us all about SSDs. Yes, yes. He'll debunk some of the, some of the mysteries behind SSDs and tell you why they're awesome if you didn't know already. Yeah, so if you wanted to buy a new gaming system, if you wanted to buy new gaming accessories, or if you wanted to upgrade your current system with some of the fastest technology on the market, this is the show for you to watch. So let's get started. Yeah, I think so. Let's Without further ado, I think it's time for us to welcome to the show, Mr. Alan Malventano. Hey guys, how's it going? Fantastic, Alan. Thank you very much for coming on The Know How. You are our guru for all things storage. In fact, I've had you on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Screen We've had savers. you on Screen Savers. So you're the guy to go to when we need to choose high-performance accessories for our gaming laptops, desktops, and the like. Now, Brian, later on, you've got a review of the Acer Predator G6, which yes. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm doing any spoilers by saying you liked it. Uh, maybe just a little bit. Uh, as much to give it a very extensive review. And by extensive, I mean like four five months. Right, right. But we are ready for uh, for you to send that back because what? Acer's coming out with the 1080. Well, yeah, if, if they happen to have a new one, I will gladly send <laughs> it in to do another review. But this segment is not about that pre-configured desktop. This segment is all about what should you do if you need to choose an SSD. Now, Alan, there are people out there who they've written into us, uh, either through our Google Plus group or over Twitter, and they say, well, I've got this, this SSD I could buy for $40, and it's the same capacity as the one that you recommended for $80. How, how much worse can it really be? What would you typically just say to someone who's, who's considering a budget buy? So the thing with budget buys to worry about is endurance, like you know, how good is the flash that they used on that, how many cycles can it handle, um, and probably reliability, but that really varies based on the company that you're going with. So you kind of just have to do some little background research there and see if there are reviews and like if people have been using that, you know, a product from that company for a while just to see how reliable that is. Um, and uh, but other than that, if you can find a budget SSD and the, and the reliability looks good and uh, you're not going to be too demanding on it, if you're just going to do like kind of casual gaming and you're mostly desktop stuff, chances are it's going to do you just fine. Right, and and that's one of the things. Like for example, OCZ got a really, really bad rep. Mm -hmm. Deservedly, they had some some bad product. <laughs> uh, but then they were bought by Toshiba, and some of their product has actually been okay. I mean, it's not the fastest on the market, but it definitely falls into the budget category. Uh, I, one of the things that I've I've liked to do though, I've I've told I've told people that the difference between a lot of the budget categories mm -hmm. and the faster categories are normally like ten percent, fifteen percent. And so for me, I always pay a little bit extra because not necessarily of the speed, but 
I like when manufacturers will over-provision their SSDs. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan, what's, what is over-provisioning? So that's basically when you have a difference between uh, what is called the logical area. In other words, how large the SSD appears to your operating system, like what size of a drive it looks like. Uh, difference between that and the amount of flash that's physically installed on the product. So consumer SSDs will typically have something like between 5 and 7% over-provisioning. So there's, you know, if it's a 120 gig SSD, it'll have 5 to 7% more physical flash installed on it. Right, and that's just because as the flash cells fail, you have extra to just provision too. That's that's more the secondary purpose. Um, the primary purpose is really just to to give you more room to spread around the Got workload. It. Okay. Um, and to take this to an extreme, enterprise SSDs can be up to, I mean, they could be like 100% over provision. That could be literally double the amount of flash on it compared to what's available, just so that they can you know, uh, it, it spread those heavier workloads across more flash. Right, and, and actually some of the uh, utilities that come with the enterprise SSDs that I've used from Samsung, Intel, and Kingston, they actually allow you to set how much you want to provision. And so, for, you know, a lot of us, oh, that's cool. we, we'll actually subtract yeah. the usable space just to have a huge number of cells sitting in the yep. background waiting for yep. us. So between, you can do that. Yeah. Between like a normal SSD and an enterprise SSD, the prices just go up wildly or is it like would it it's, be it's, worth it's to get an enterprise a, drive for my gaming it, pc it's it's from a couple of, it's for a couple of reasons if you could find an enterprise drive and it's like cheaper than a consumer drive that'd be really really rare but if you happen to you know find somebody just uh somebody just decommissioned a generation old uh ssd you know enterprise server or something that are just trying to unload a bunch and it's a real deal um yeah it'll work but it won't be optimized for consumer workloads. Uh, enterprise SSD firmwares will be more optimized for continuous random access or just like continuous database loads, not the consumer type of thing where you have a small area will we'll see random access for like, you know, page file or registry hive or stuff like that that's stored on the disk. But most of the other stuff on those consumer drives is just static data. You know, you downloaded a game, all the contents of that game is now sitting on that SSD. It's not going to be manipulated. It's just going to be read from. Um, so the, the price increase you see on the enterprise drives, most of it is due to just the fact that you're buying more flash memory, uh, to get the higher over provisioning and, uh, and you know, the other, uh, however many percent, you know, reason for the, for the cost increase is there is an awful lot more testing that goes into enterprise SSD firmwares and controllers and just much more validation that goes into that. And for a more thorough discussion on enterprise SSDs, watch our episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech with Alan Malventano, because he goes really in depth to what it takes to create an enterprise part versus a consumer part. Because it's mm -hmm. it's not just over-provisioning, it's not just speed. There's actually a couple of different things you need to consider when you're looking at a high IOPS device versus a high bandwidth device, which we'll get to in just a bit. But before we get there, Alan, uh, help me out here. If you go to the overhead, Patrick, we've got a couple of devices here that, uh, well, we've, we've had over the years. This was the first SSD I had. This actually came inside, uh, there was a Dell. Uh, I, th I think it was an Inspiron. It was like a 13 inch, it was their first Ultrabook. This was a thousand dollar option, 64 <laughs> gigabytes. This was actually a pretty good one. This was built on SLC flash, right? Yes, it was. All aluminum. Not a bad drive, not the fastest drive, but I mean, it was compared to the hard drives we had at the time. This what, was ridiculously fast. What's the difference it was, between regular flash and SLC flash? Well, Alan could probably Sorry. answer that. <laughs> so uh, most consumer flash you'll see now is multi-level cell, which, is, which means you can store two bits in one memory cell. SLC, S is for single, so that you can only store one bit in a cell. And then uh, consumer SSDs like the Samsung Evo series nowadays, and there's other products that also do this, um, other budget style SSDs, they will use triple level cell or TLC, uh, and that stores three bits. So you can have eight different states within one cell. So it's all about how many bits can you cram into a cell, and then you have a finite number of cells on a flash memory die just based on you know how, how the technology has progressed. All right. Now, Alan, we move from that to these. This was, I think it was a 470 and an 830. I can't, I'm not sure if this is a 470. Yep. Uh, That's a 470. Yeah, and then this is the one I used to replace it. And uh, it was interesting because, of course, they're bigger. That was a 64 gigabyte. This is a 128. This is a 256. So the, yep. the capacities increased. The speeds increased. This was actually a SATA 3, SATA Revision 3 drive. 
Yep. And uh, and then from there, we were off to the races. We've, we've had <laughs> SSDs from Intel and from Kingston, and some of these are ridiculously fast. In fact, the fastest of them already, the, the Savage and uh, all the ones like it, I think it already maxes out the uh, the SATA bus. You, it's about 550 megabytes per second uh, read f and 540 write or so. Yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. Most um, most SSDs these days will saturate. It's actually kind of going a little bit backwards on the writes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's because people are moving to more of a budget style flash, triple level cell, which requires more time to program because you're trying to get that voltage at an exact point and you have to you have eight different eight different variables there. You have to squeeze it into just the right spot uh, to correctly store that data. Um, so that aside, the read performance is largely just maxing serial ATA uh, six gigabit, which is somewhere around 520, 550 mic per second, depending on how you're measuring it. Right, and, and once you add in all the overhead for, for actually controlling the bits. And then yep. they've got this. So this is the new hotness, and again, all the major manufacturers have some form of this. This is an M.2 uh, format. This one, again, is the Predator from Kingston, this is our HyperX line. Uh, yep. Not as fast, actually, as I think Intel has a, a one that goes twice as fast. This will do 1,400 megabytes per second read, 1,000 megabytes per second write. Uh, I think the Intel one might actually have like 50% over that. But mm -hmm. the M.2 was a way to get past the limitations of SATA because now we're actually directly PCIe attached. Yep. This is supposedly the new hotness, but, Alan, the reason why we brought you on is because our listeners... They need the knowledge, and the knowledge that's not getting to them is that it's not all about that transfer number. That's that's the holy grail, right? Just just give me a bigger number for transfer rates, and that makes right. it a better device. It, that's right, yeah, Alan. Well, it's not absolutely necessary mm -hmm. because a lot of times, if it's the only drive in your system, and you're not really moving anything large to or from it to some other drive, that also has to be a very quick thing, right? Um, you're where are you going to get the stuff from? to write to it at a gig per second, right? Um, I, now, reads are kind of justified because the faster you can get your read performance, the the shorter amount of time it takes to get the data into your system. You're trying to load a game. If the you know if it's just loading large files off of the drive and you have a SATA as a single SATA SSD versus a M.2 SSD that can do, you know, like a gig and a half, two gig per second, you're talking about three to four times the throughput, right? Hmm. So straight throughput, it was really going to help you for like large file transfers because if you have something that's really small, uh, then it's down to how nimble is the storage compared to how much of like a dragster is it? How you know how fast can it go in a straight line? Um, and those are two very different things, right? You'll have uh, some SSDs can go very fast in a straight line. However, once you start to try to do things like uh, random access, random reads from them, they might you know they might slow down a little bit. Or if you try to mix in a few writes while you're trying to do those reads, say you're downloading something, downloading another game on Steam, and trying to launch a different game, uh, you know the the writes from the download could potentially slow down the reads that you're trying to do. So it all it all varies based on different controllers, different flash implementations. Um, but from what I've seen, uh, drives like the 850 Evo that are really really optimized. And they're using 3D VNAND, and especially the ones that are 500 gig or higher capacity in that series, they can saturate SATA writing straight to the TLC once you've gone through the SLC buffer that's on those drives. Even straight to TLC speed is still 500 meg per second. Um, so those drives just perform really, really consistently. Um, and they can even, in some cases, be more consistent than what I've seen from some of even the higher end uh, M.2 drives like the really? 950 Pro. How, how yeah. does that work out? I mean, if the M.2 has such a higher transfer rate, both on reads and writes, how, how could I ever match that performance on a SATA device? So what kind of happens as a side effect is if you think about quality of service settings on like a router, right? Uh, you know how you have to back the bandwidth back a little bit from your maximum speed that you could possibly go right. so that nothing has to wait in line excessively long and everything stays snappy on a network. Uh, and that's probably something you guys might have covered or might cover in the future. But uh, that thing called quality of service is to kind of, you know, have a traffic cop in there that's going to limit things. Well, SATA SSDs, if the flash is also fast flash, like the same flash is on the 850 Evo that's on the 950 Pro, same type of flash, the flash itself goes you know, the, the, the same speed, roughly, depending, because there's variations for TLC and MLC that's on the 950 Pro. But it's still fast flash on both devices. However, the SATA device 
has a forced bottleneck, right? It is mm. forced to limit itself to the speed of the interface, which is 500 to 550 meg per second. Um, whereas the M.2, it has a PCIe by four interface that none of the M.2 drives that have come out so far can saturate that. Right. So they are doing everything they can to go as fast as possible, which potentially means things might have to wait in line a little bit longer if okay. you're trying to write to it, you know, and you're actually loading it down with random writes, for example. Whereas, you know, that, that SATA drive is actually looks more consistent in our results. Uh, it's not going as fast. It's not getting the same ultimate speed, but it has fewer IOs that have to wait as long as they do on something like the 950 Pro when you try to load it down. Right. Yeah. When you have a, a SATA connected device, I mean, you've actually got more consistent throughput. It's more consistent performance. Whereas yeah. M.2, you're going to get a lot of burst, a whole lot of burst performance because a lot of stuff has to wait in the buffer. It has to sit and, there and wait. That makes sense. And that's now you got to be careful, though, because that's not to say that all SATA devices. Right. 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 are going to be consistent. <laughs> yeah. uh, because trust me, there are plenty of ones out there that do very, very bad things when you try to write to them randomly. Um, and uh, But that's not one of them. Uh, so uh, Let's yeah. talk a little bit more about some, some of those very bad things because one of the things that has come up as of late, and this was I got this from PC Perspective, mm -hmm. is this idea of using latency or a, a combination, a hybrid benchmark of latency slash throughput to actually evaluate real-world performance of SSDs. Because as you said, SSDs will do absolutely fantastic if you tag a really large file, either to read or to write. But the problem is yep. in the real world, we have not one big read or one big write. We have thousands, tens of thousands, millions of operations every second, some of them big and some of them small. Alan, this, this is something that's vexing the performance community because it's difficult to figure out if you have two super high performance drives, which one will be faster, uh, even if you start looking at IOPS. So how, how do you evaluate a drive in terms of real world speed? Right, so the catch that I have discovered and over the past uh, year or two been trying to develop better testing to demonstrate is a lot of the times when these, especially the consumer drives, um, they won't necessarily perform poorly on average. Uh, and, I, and I say that very carefully because like if you do, if you uh, even run trace based benchmarks like PC mark or, or, or the like, or things that are basically playing back uh, the equivalent of trying to load a game or trying to run office or trying to do productivity stuff or, you know, importing pictures or whatever or whatnot. Um, all those tests just give you like a number at the end. Uh, so you can have an SSD that goes really, really fast, but say for a second or two, out of every minute, it just slows to a crawl. Right. Well, you would totally, you would totally miss that in those, in all those tests that we see a lot, all over the place, and anybody that reviews SSDs. Um, but you know that number can just get, kind of get lost in the average when it did slow to a halt. However, that would be something that you would be painfully obvious to if yeah. you were in the middle of doing mm -hmm. something yeah. with your system, and then all of a sudden everything screeches to a halt for a second or two. That would be like, whoa, what's going on? Why is you know why isn't this just what happened, right? That, you would think that's something was wrong. one of those weird things that you actually notice that more on a super fast computer than you do on a slow computer. If it's a slower computer, you're just like, yeah, okay, it's slow. Yeah, that's the but natural. But if it's blazing fast and then suddenly it stops for 10 seconds, you're like, wait, what? Yeah. I, I've got all the, yeah. the best performance parts. How could this possibly be happening? <laughs> right, right. And it's definitely a big like smack in the face to that. And there's even other things where you could even have sub-second, uh, like in other words, like say out of every second, uh, some IO, some type of I/O just happens to take very, very long to perform. Uh, so, say you have some program that's like that downloading something or just manipulating some data, and it's just doing it in a way that the SSD just does not like, right? Uh, that thing can cause the controller to get kind of wrapped around the axle to try to handle those requests, and then while it's trying to do that, that video that you're streaming or that other thing that you're just like you know just have continuously running off of your drive that thing just screeches to a halt intermittently while that, so you'd be actually caused by some other thing in the background. Could even be something as simple as like a background, uh, like Windows Defender scanning your drive oh, or God, something like that. Uh, yeah, it just <laughs> depends on what it is, right? So uh, that's, that's kind of the motivation for coming up with some way of, all right, uh, how can you throw a whole bunch of IOs at a drive and take all of them, log every single one, like sort them all into a very fine-grained histogram and then plot that stuff out and show, okay, uh, I had some, I had like, these IOs were taking 10% of the time of the run. 
how long did those take? And that's what our new plot shows, right? It's like it actually shows you, you could tell very easily if you had a, a line that went kind of straight up towards the, the very low latency, but then at the 50% point, it shot across to the right to like where a hard drive would sit, and then it went the rest of the way up, you would know that that SSD was performing like a hard drive half of the time. Right. Hmm. Um, yeah, so it it's, makes it kind of painfully in your face about stuff. And, <sighs> so, you know, and, and some some companies might not like the way of presenting this, um, but uh, I kind of submit that those companies are probably the ones that have the, you know, the issues that they need to work on and to you, get rid of that. And you know what? This is, this is good. You have to shake up the benchmark community every once in a while because what happens, and, and you know this painfully, you are painfully yeah. aware of this, Alan, when you build a benchmark, everyone builds to the benchmark. You, right. will, you will tweak your firmware, your, your controller, so that it scores really well in that benchmark, no matter if that benchmark actually applies to a real-world thing. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that goes back to the start of benchmarks. Uh, AMD yep. did that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, ATI, NVIDIA, every major manufacturer at some point right. has chased a benchmark. So, oh. in SSDs, it can't just be, oh, well, what is the greatest theoretical right. in lab one instance throughput can I get? I like Alan's way of saying, no, look, let's let's look at a bunch of different ways of throwing data at this and how does it respond? Oh, Alan, knowing that, what what are your favorites? Because I mean, I, my, my favorite is uh, right now are the Kingstons. I, I've, I've got Samsungs, I had issues with some Samsungs. Intels are good. Uh, I've had actually pretty good durability on, on Intels. But Kingstons right now have been the only units that I've used both in enterprise and on my desktop that I've been happy with. I know they're not the fastest performers, but for me, I, I like it. It's, it's consistent enough that it's my choice. What is it for you? Uh, so the HyperX Predator is actually a pretty good pick. Um, you know, has good performance. Um, I, I like, believe it or not, I still like 850 Evos really? right now. Wow. Uh, it, it, as long as you're getting the 500 gig or higher capacity, uh, I like those mainly, uh, you know, for the performance consistency and just like they're really, really super consistent. I, I, in, I, I included an 850 Evo as like my staple to represent like best case SATA performance. Uh, in my recent M.2 SSD review that I did. So, and that, which is just really telling. This is a TLC SSD uh, that I threw in with, you know, these fire-breathing M SATA PCIe by 4 SSDs. Um, and it actually kind of embarrassed some of them as far as from a well, performance consistency standpoint. Again, it wasn't as, you know, as ultimately fast, but it, man, was that thing consistent. Um, uh, let's see, where else? Uh, I, I, hate, if you... I hate that we might have to choose between benchmark bragging rights and actual, like, real-world performance. I don't like that at all. That's not cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, you will, if you had a single uh, 850 Evo versus a single 950 Pro, you're going to probably notice a little bit of a difference. 950 Pro is probably going to be a little bit quicker. But if you want to be really picky about consistency, it looks like the SATA part actually wins, for the moment at least. Um, so I do like the 950 Pro. Uh, the only catch is all of these M.2 parts tend to be kind of pricey. Yes. Um, you know they're 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 running about twice, roughly twice the cost. Um, yeah. Compared to I'm looking on Amazon a, and it looks like the 850 Evos go for like around 160, and then the 950 Pros are about 340. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So you're and, talking and that's about all, actually that's already an improvement because just about eight months ago it was four to five times. Of, of the capacity price. So that's coming down, but it's it's probably not going to reach parity for a while. Yeah, but uh but if you're if you're definitely a if you're more of a stickler for like the mantra of it's not how fast you go, it's how well you go fast. Uh, <laughs> if you want to do that or yeah. or especially if you want to uh buy, you know, say you want a terabyte, you buy a pair of those 850 Evos, you put you just use good old Intel RAID. Suicide uh, RAID. <laughs> it, it just death, yeah, death wish raid. Uh, make sure you hey, back up, obviously. This um, this is death wish raid. So this is this is a what a three four year old laptop, mm -hmm. but the uh, the it's a, it's a PCI SSD, but it's a proprietary one. It's actually two SSDs on a card. It's yep. one twenty eight gigabytes on each side, and it's it's raid zero. So why yep. is that a death wish? Because if either of those ever has an issue, it kills the entire array. Yeah, you're, 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 doubling, you're doubling your potential for a failure because like when one side goes down, it knocks down the whole thing. And there's actually laptops. We've looked at one uh, not too long ago. It actually had a card in it with a pair of M.2s <laughs> on either side. So it was, you know, RAID 0 by 4. But it is um, so fast. So fast. So, well, so not only do you get 
uh, the the in in my opinion kind of more refined controllers and firmware on the SATA side because right. again those have been around for many more years than compared to the PCI stuff um, so far. Um, not only do you get that slightly more you know better refinement there, but now you're spreading the load out across multiple of them. Um, so you do double your throughput. As you you know, double the number of drives, there is a ceiling. It's around a gig and a half, which just so happens to be around how fast the M.2 parts are going. Um, so you can you can achieve that with just SATA parts. But the better advantage is that even though they're they're being very consistent on performance by spreading the load out on the RAID, you're actually spreading out if you have any kind of a random workload hitting the drive. It each individual drive sees the, the fraction of that workload. So right. it actually performs even more consistent and, you know, responds even faster because it's not loaded down with a queue of things that it needs to do. Uh, there is no line. It's just doing, you know, handling the one thing that you told it to do, which it's going to do very, very quickly. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still, like, even my personal system, I'm still on a RAID 0, on a, on a three drive RAID 0 of SATA devices. Um, and, and that's with, I mean, I, I have... A lot of stuff at my disposal. I you could have, have a few in my more, personal system. You have a few system. more devices at your disposal than most. It, it, I, yeah. I, I could. And yeah. yet, on my personal system, that's what I've got in there. And it works just fine for me. Oh, Alan, we, we do want to have you back because actually, I, I would love to get your input on a, a build that we're going to be having pretty soon. I, I'd say by the end of the summer, we're, we're building our own know how ultimate box. And uh, we are going to need some storage expertise, both for SSD and for rotating storage. So we're, we're going to have you back on the show, but uh, we, unfortunately we have to end now because we have to get over to his review. Mm -hmm. Could you please tell the folks where they can find you at, uh, of course, PC Perspective? Where can they find all your reviews, all your in-depth analysis? Where can they find info to geek out like no place other? Uh, it is PCPER, PCPER.com. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Alan Malventano, he is the storage editor for PC Perspective. We thank you for being and for dumping your knowledge on know-how. Thanks for having me. Coming up next, we've got uh, Brian's review, a long-term review, of the Acer Predator G6. If you wanted to know how fast a pre-built machine could be, you're going to want to stick around. But before we do that, Brian... I want to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Know How. I do too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thankfully, it's a sponsor that we've had for a while. They understand us. They get us because they make it easy for me as a developer to get my project, whatever it might be, onto the internet. Now, you know I'm old. Pretty old. Yeah. I'm you're, old. I'm, yeah. I'm but you're young at heart, Padre. Young at heart, but yeah. I am old enough to remember a time <laughs> when the only way to get something on the internet was to buy the hardware, buy a place to put the hardware, right. buy someone to maintain the hardware, Ugh. get a line, maybe make a, an agreement with a financial processor, so, and then hope to God that your hardware holds up. That's that's I not how know. we do it anymore. I, I feel like I, I take some things for granted because of all of the struggles that you have told me about. And, and you know what? I think it's better that we take it for granted because it means that we get companies like DigitalOcean. Now, DigitalOcean is the new way to get present on the internet. Whether it's a portfolio, a website, a database, a server, an app, whatever it might be, DigitalOcean is the way for you to take your special project and uh, push it out to one, two, three, a thousand, a million users at once. Now, DigitalOcean is a, uh, it's a service that allows you to take whatever it is that you want to put on the internet and put it into a container, what they call a droplet. Now, once it's in a droplet, you can run it across their entire infrastructure from one CPU up to a thousand CPUs with unlimited amount of SSD space to back it up. DigitalOcean is used by over 600,000 developers, including Twitch Randall Schwartz, Aram Newcomb, and myself. You could deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or a simple API, and you get to choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD, yep, those are all options, as well as one of the many pre-configured one-click installs like Drupal, Docker, or Node.js. That means you can get up and running quickly with pre-configured packages or, because they give you root access, you can configure your infrastructure exactly the way that you need with 100% SSDs in state-of-the-art data centers around the world. DigitalOcean is highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business, and you can use advanced features like floating IPs for high availability, private networking, and automated deployments via API. 
Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate is that they've got an active and engaged community. The customers of DigitalOcean appreciate the service so much that they spend hours and hours of their time in the forums answering questions from new users. That tells me that this is not just a service, it's a community. It's so easy to get started, you can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. Why aren't you using DigitalOcean? It's got incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing with servers starting at just $5 per month. And there's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Just visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code KNOWHOW for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do for you. That's DigitalOcean.com. DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code KNOWHOW in the billing section to get your $10 credit for free. DigitalOcean, the smarter way to be on the Internet. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of know-how. Now, Brian, mm -hmm. <clears throat> a few months ago, I got a box, a nice yes. box, a box that contained uh, the fastest pre-built computer that I've, uh, I've seen in quite a while. That's right. It was a, a plug-and-play PC option is the best way I'd describe it, and I kind of fell in love with it. You kind of fell in love with it, which meant that I wasn't able to take it home. No, 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 no. 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 Uh, I, because, Padre, I don't feel like you would have taken the time, the, the extensive amount of re reviewing that <laughs> I put into it. That's true. I, I think uh, there's been countless hours of doom, and uh, some homeworld played on that, and you know, in, in both 1080p and 4K. Well, what I realized is that my gaming library was woefully under, I don't know, it was just not at the par that the gaming PC was I at, so it. I had I to wait for a game like Doom to come out and play that to make sure that it was definitely, you know, pushing the limit of the PC. Yeah, I got it. I think we've teased this out long enough. Without further ado, here's Cranky Hippo's review of the Acer Predator G6. Sometimes as a gamer, you just want to play games, kick ass, and chew bubblegum. But what if you're all out of bubblegum? Introducing the Acer Predator G6 PC gaming machine. With its distinct logo and case design, the Predator manages to look like if a T-Rex had its way with a tank. And that's not a bad thing. You won a game. PC. <laughs> For those gamers out there who don't have time to bleed, building their own gaming rig, the Predator G6 is the 15-year-old me's wet dream of a LED-lit, plastic-forged badassery that oozes over-the-top design with hardware to match. It even has a turbo button that pushes the i7 to a blistering 4.5 gigahertz without any noise. But if you're like me, you'll hit the turbo button once and never turn it off. On Amazon, you can pick up the Predator G6 for $1,699. And here's a list of the specs that come for that money. It's got a 6th generation Intel Core i7-6700 running at 4 GHz with boot turbo boost up to 4.5. Comes with 16 GB of DDR4 RAM, a GTX 980 graphics card, 256 GB SSD paired with a 2 TB 7200 RPM SATA hard drive, a Blu-ray disc player with a DVD burner, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, six USB 3 ports, two USB 2 ports, three display ports, one HDMI port, a DVI port, and powering it all is a 730 watt PSU. With these specs, you'd expect a decent 3D Mark score, and you'd be correct. The overall Fire Strike score was 11,251, better than 85% of all results. But those are just numbers. What's it like running games at 4K resolution, you might ask? It was not a problem playing games like Homeworld Remastered Edition or Portal 2, but to really stretch this PC's legs, I played Doom. Lots and lots of Doom. I was able to play Doom at 4K with an average FPS of between 45 to 60 with everything set to Ultra. I did have to tweak the texture resolution a smidge to 90% to get buttery smoothness, but... More than just a gaming machine, I use this as an everyday PC. Windows 10 boots in under 10 seconds. I also used it for video editing, which turned out this review faster than a bloodthirsty pinky descending on a baby space marine. I did encounter a few bugs with the Turbo software in the beginning. After long stints of gaming or just being on for a few days, I would sometimes get a crashing or freezing error. 
This was fixed by a software update, but I encourage anyone who buys this PC to update your Acer Predator Sense drivers before all else. Straight away, I must tell you, this is not a PC for a builder, more for a plug and play tinkerer. Once the side panel is removed, it's clear that while the Predator may be ugly in a good way on the outside, it's kind of ugly on the bad way on the inside. The only part you really have easy access to for upgrading is the video card, while the RAM slots are mostly blocked by a heat sink and cable management was definitely an afterthought. One beautiful aspect of the Predator's design, though, is the beauty of silence. With its two-sided airflow, the Predator never made any noise, even when being pushed to the limit while gaming. So in the end, would I recommend the Predator G6? Yes. Hell yes. In fact, if you've been waiting for a plug-and-play PC with some personality, then get the G6. The only people who'd be disappointed in this machine are those who would wish to have easy access for components when upgrading, or just aren't down with the aesthetics. Which, I'll be honest, I still think it's ugly, but ugly in a mean way. Like a rabid pug that eats up video games for breakfast and spits out hours of fun. So, I, I get the impression that you actually kind of like that box. I did, I did. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest, when I first saw it, I, I didn't really like the design, but it, it actually grew on me a lot. You know? Yeah, yeah. You, you said something. You're like, this is the kind of design that a 13-year-old would want on his monster gaming box. Yes, exactly. And uh, after playing Doom and having the LEDs and the turbo button and it, everything, it's ambiance. Yeah, it is. It is ambiance. Yeah, and it, it struck a chord with my inner 13-year-old. So I, that's kind of why I appreciated it. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, it did have all the specs that you wanted. It's got yes. that quad-core 6700K. It's got the 16 gigabytes of DDR4. Right. Uh, it had the two terabytes of spinning storage plus the uh, M.2 SSD. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, all the accoutrements from the, the Blu-ray driver, the DVD, and that really, really, really nice uh, NVIDIA GTX 980. Although yes. I will say, now that they've got the 1080 out, um, I mean, they're gonna have, oh, obviously geez. they're gonna have to update the Predator, which means they're gonna have to send us another box. I, I mean, if they have to, sure. <laughs> I wouldn't say no, uh, but yeah, definitely a great rig for just plug and play gaming, um, and then enough room for expansion if you wanted to in the future. Right. Uh, we should probably add because there there will be people who will watch this and they'll kind of put their noses up. I, I understand that. I mean, if if you are not one of the people. Who likes to buy a turnkey solution for gaming then this is not for you and, and there's i mean i mm -hmm. i kind of mm -hmm. fall into that i like building my own stuff uh, in fact alex you you built your own rig didn't you kind of yeah. he went a oh, different route well 10 years ago yeah oh no no you just built one with a xeon didn't no you? i just I, I bought a dell workstation oh, and so added, added my own video card mm -hmm. so yeah I, I think that's actually the approach that a lot of us are taking now as as we get a little older we say look i would like a warranty Right. And I, I don't have the time to build it. I'd like to, but I'd rather buy a box that's capable and then maybe plug something in to make it a bit better. Yeah, and I think, Alex, for you, your, your aspect was that you wanted something quiet. Right. Yeah, that was part of it, and and you know we use those Dell workstations here, so I've experience with them, and I know that they're really nicely designed and yeah. good airflow, and they're just very clean inside. Right. But that's also one of the things that both of us love about the Predator line, which is it is silent. It is very silent. You can have it on your desk next to your monitor versus the the super gaming PC that sounds like a, a jet engine, <laughs> like a turbo. Yeah, exactly. Really but like that, my no. Dell workstation looks very nondescript. Right. Versus yours, flashy. which is like. What? I, you know, when I was running through hell, I, I really liked the red LEDs <laughs> that's, on it. That's yeah. the, right, uh, the right design to have. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, look for more long-term reviews. Uh, folks, there's a lot of people who will give you unboxings. There are a lot of people who will show you what they think after using a product for a few hours. We're one of the only ones who will let you know the truth after five months of usage. and uh, Extensive yeah, research. We're really happy mm -hmm. with the Predator line. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, coming up next, we're going to be taking taking you to the Augmented World Expo at the Santa Clara Convention Center in Santa Clara, California. We found, well, something that's a little unconventional, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an accessory for you gamers out there who maybe want a little more punch in your uh, first-person shooting environment. Oh, ho, ho. But before we do that, you know what we need to do? We need to get some knowledge about payments. Yes, we do. Now, if you run a website, if you have a service, if you've got a portfolio out there, at some point, you're going to want to monetize it. I mean, 
some of the most beautiful websites are great because they contain a lot of passionate, enthusiastic information, mm -hmm. but unless you have a way to maintain that, it's not going to last for very long. Or if you have someone that's interested in what you have, you don't want them to have to jump through a bunch of hoops just to purchase it. Right. So why not use a solution that makes it easy for you to enable and for others to use a payment solution? And that payment solution is Braintree. Oh, Braintree is a mobile app development for the rest of us. Integrating payments no longer has to be a difficult, traumatic experience. With Braintree, your business accepts nearly every type of payment. Now, maybe it's the next Bitcoin, or maybe the next Apple Pay, or maybe a payment that we can't even think of, but you can trust that Braintree will have support for it when it becomes popular. Uh, fortunately, Braintree's full-stack payment platform is easily adaptable to whatever the future holds, which means you can adapt easily too. Now, you can accept everything from pounds to PayPal to that next big innovation from any device with just one integration. And again, when that new payment method comes out, all you have to do is update a few lines of code. That means no late nights, no complicated recoding, no stress about staying ahead of the curve. Braintree Payments is here to help. Now, think about it. The payment solution that you choose is sort of your public facing face. It doesn't matter how good your product is. It doesn't matter how good your website is. If your payment processor doesn't do it right, if information leaks, if they allow personally identifiable information to get out into the real world, or if they provide you a payment solution that is so difficult to use that the cart gets abandoned, it's simply no go. Well, Braintree has years and years of experience in dealing with exactly those problems and those are the problems that they allow you to remove. Now, again, it's simple, secure payments that you can code and integrate quickly. The Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. They've got SDKs in seven languages, including .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby, and it's elegant code with clear documentation. No more guessing about whether or not something's going to work. When you integrate with Braintree, you integrate the right way. So here's what we want you to do. If you are looking for a full stack payment solution, you need to try Braintree. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating it into your apps is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. You can learn more at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. That's braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. Braintree Payments, the smarter way to pay. And we thank Braintree Payments for their support of knowhow. Brian, a while back, yeah. we were down at the convention center in Santa Clara. That's right. Augmented yeah. World Expo. It was uh, wearables, VR, AR, all the, the, you know, the sort of the buzzwords around the Silicon Valley. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that you kind of have to exper experience in person because when you're just trying to do interviews and things like that, it's like people with goggles on. Right. Yeah. And you don't really grasp what uh, the tangibleness of it if you're not actually there. But... The one that you want to talk about, uh, it, it caught me off it's guard. It's different. It's definitely it's different. different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've seen products like this before. In fact, uh, back on Before You Buy, I remember we reviewed this boom chair, which yeah. was basically a really bad chair that had speakers that <laughs> vibrated your butt. Right. Uh, it was not good at all. Not impressive. No. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of the technologies that try to take something from the virtual world and push it into the real world mm -hmm. are like. They're kind of haphazard, half-assed attempts <laughs> that just don't yep. turn out really well. Yep. Well, we wandered by a booth at AWE, and they've got a different way to take something from the virtual and bring it into reality. So without further ado, let's take you down to Santa Clara for some Augmented World Expo. Watching VR and AR is magical, but for it to be truly magical, you need to feel it. That's why I'm speaking with Zach at Subpack, who's going to explain why you might be sitting or wearing your next AR VR experience. Zach, what is Subpack? So Subpack is a physical audio technology. In reality, we don't experience sound with just our ears. We experience it with our entire body. It's vibration. So in order to get a full reality experience virtually, you have to be able to feel audio. So what we do is we take low frequencies and we transmit them directly into the body. You can see behind me here my friend Clark, who goes by Grimecraft. He works for a company called The Wave, which you can see over there. And they're doing a virtual music experience. It's kind of like Tilt Brush but for music. So he's DJing a set right now and able to feel all of the frequencies in his body from the set 
with a simple plug and play technology. There's nothing binary involved. There's no middleware. There's no coding. It's pure audio energy. So you put, put just plug and play. So it's for the creator all the way to the consumer. So if you're designing a VR experience, if you're using a VR or AR experience, this is how you'll create those sounds because it allows you to go all the way down to five hertz, which is lower than you're able to hear. And then if you're using VR, you're getting that full body sensation. And when it comes to creation, there's no really pure reference right now because bass is physics. Bass waves are long. So in order to properly get those in your mix, it's very difficult. It depends on the shape of the room. Like right now you can hear his music playing. That sounds differently to the ear depending on where you are. This will be a pure reference no matter where you're on top of Mount Everest or you know in a cupboard under the stairs hanging out with Harry Potter. Uh, Zach... Uh, to be honest, we have seen products like this, uh, boom chairs and, and sound effect adding right. accessories, and we have not been impressed. But we had a chance to sit on the sub pack, and i got to say, you got something right. I mean, I can actually feel it, even if I can't hear it. What did you do? What's inside the technology that makes sub pack different? So before previously people have used tactile audio, and we never will claim to have vended tactile audio, but we have perfected it because nobody else was doing it high fidelity. Before they were just taking transducers, putting them on your back, and it felt like, you know, uh, like a dwarf punching you in the kidneys. This actually is a perfect representation of bass frequencies. So by going to the music producers in the world, you know, Timbaland is a partner in the company, Richie Houghton is a partner in the company. By going and working with these music producers, we've been able to create a tool that actually represents the frequencies that they need to create music. So by making it a professional tool as well as a consumer tool has elevated it from, you know, what could have been just a simple toy to something that professionals use who are Grammy Award winners all the way down to a kid in his bedroom playing Call of Duty. So what it does is instead of pushing air, we're pushing you. So in a speaker, you have a magnet and a cone and the cone moves the air. This is the opposite. So we're pushing you instead of the air. You are the base cabinet, essentially. It's a much better approach because more of the energy gets transferred into the body. And it also means you've got a wearable device and you could actually be either DJing or walking down the street feeling it without actually hearing it, which, which I love. Exactly. And we do a lot of work with the deaf and hard of hearing community. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we do a lot of work with the deaf and hard of hearing community because... They can't hear music, but they can definitely feel it. And one of our goals as a company is to reduce tinnitus because a lot of people go to a big show, go to a big club, and they're like, oh, my God, you know, that bass nectar show was amazing I could because you know, that visceral experience of feeling sound. And they go home and they put on their headphones and they turn it up to 11. All that's going to do is give you hearing loss and tinnitus. This actually allows you to turn the volume down but turn the bass up, which is better for you all around. Zach, where would you like to see this in the coming years? Because right now you, you, are, you are creating the experience off of the audio out. Right. Would you like to see more developers actually include the option for tactile vests and tactile accessories so that maybe you could get a separate channel to drive your technology? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're constantly iterating. And the easiest way for us to get this in front of people and get people using it wasn't to take a dictatory approach and say, this is the plugin you have to use. This is the special middleware. This is the different types of things you're going to have to do that are more complicated than what you're doing already. This allows you to do it now. And so we're taking a collaborative approach to VR and saying, what is it that you want in this product? We're always going to be able to do a plug and play, but do we want to isolate and make new ways of experiencing sound? Absolutely. All right, let's get to the brass tacks. If they wanted to try a sub pack today, I know you have two models. Give me pricing and availability, and then where can they go to find them? They can get them on www.thesubpack.com. The Seatback S2 is 299 and the wearable version is 349 That's the M2. And you can get them on our website and a bunch of different retailers uh, that we list uh, on our site. Zach, thank you very much for speaking with us. Nice with you thank well. you for sharing your tech. And if you are an AR or a VR fanatic and you want to feel it without submitting to dwarven kidney punching folk, <laughs> you got to try Subpac. I, I don't know, Brian. There's, there was something about the way that they had built the product that it just felt right. It did not feel like I was strapping a speaker onto my back. It actually felt 
like you know a, a, an output device. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think that's the part that a lot of companies kind of have trouble um, is bringing something that's virtual and making it feel real. And so when I put the headphones on, it felt like the sound was moving through my body. Right. It felt like I was sitting in a like I don't like the the cars that do this, you know, the like cars that are shaking themselves apart because the bass in the car is so big. But it it was like a it was a very visceral experience yes. sitting and ex uh, listening to the music and feeling the the vibrations and stuff. Like Kara, uh, she loved that DJ thing. She loved she it. She really wanted to try she, it. She she thought she was in the club when she put <laughs> she put the headphones on. She closed her eyes and she was like in the middle of a dance floor and she was going crazy with it. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about that whole booth is is not only that they're local, but that they they've basically taken an idea that people thought was stupid. I mean, we because we've had, again, we've had those products before yeah. and they've always failed. And they said, no, it's actually a good idea. It's just had really bad implementation. Exactly. And then they made a good implementation. I love the fact that you can buy a unit that's on your chair, so it retrofits your chair, yeah. but more, I love that vest. I so want right? that vest. I want Leo to buy that vest <laughs> so we can use it with the HTC Vive. Well, and so I think the, the most interesting part about that whole convention is that you can kind of, you can see the direction that we're going in. You can see that these are the little baby steps that lead us into the AR VR world right. that we have like imagined in sci-fi and things. But you can also see that with this rig and VR goggles, you read Ready Player yeah. One, right? Yeah. It's gonna. We're just it's, gonna have a ha tactic suit that you wear that then just completely immerses you in a world. Whether or not that's a good thing, I don't know, but it's kind of exciting. Precisely. And actually, the, the, I was thinking about another book, um, the uh, Demon and Freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, which I love. That's those are fantastic books. You go pick those up right now. They're not advertising with us, but go get them. But at one point, uh, one of the anti-heroes has a vest, and it's a taptic vest. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like this. But what they do is it uses different patterns in different parts of the body to indicate different notifications. So imagine <laughs> a notification system using the same base technology right. that. When you get a notification, you no longer have to like check your watch or check your you phone. You just know what it you was. You just know what it is. Yeah. A and yeah, we're it's such in the nascent stage, but at least we've got companies who are trying to figure it out. So, yeah. so to Subpack, uh, great job. I and love you guys. I think just uh, it's it's sparking different ideas into avenues that we wouldn't have generally thought. And like when we first saw it, I. A lot of things for me come back to motorcycle right, riding, right. especially with technology. It did look like a motorcycle vest. It looked like a motorcycle <laughs> vest, but then we started talking about how it could be used to tell you that someone's in your blind spot or tell you someone's approaching from behind you or, you know, different scenarios where, like, if you're getting on the brakes too hard, it vibrates or something. Yeah. Just that hip, that feedback that you wouldn't get otherwise. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's using the, the body's largest organ, sense organ, which is the skin. My to, gut. To, oh, skin, yeah. <laughs> for me, it's my gut, my yeah. stomach. But for most people, it's the skin to, to convey information mm -hmm. in a way that we don't typically think information can be reliably conveyed. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah, just, it's that's rethinking awesome. the whole process. Yeah. I, I think that's what I, when I, we went to the convention, we weren't really sure what to expect, and what we came back with was more of, like, the implementation is the difficult part, right. and it's getting closer and closer to better ideas. Yeah. But it's getting, it is getting closer. So. Yes. <laughs> and, and we will try to get them in studio. We actually talked to them about maybe getting them on the new screensavers or in-house for a know-how episode with the HTC Vive. So, but I do have to say, the guy who's DJing, he might have been having the most epic DJ experience of his life, but man, like it he did not tricky. did not look cool. I mean, not that we know anything about looking no. cool, but so like. <laughs> 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 but you know what? As long as you've got those goggles on, who, who cares? cares? Who yeah. cares? <laughs> Just do it in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> uh, folks, we know that this was a lot of information. If you want to find out more about anything, more about what uh, Alan Malventano was talking about with SSDs, more about uh, Acer's lineup and uh, his review of the Predator, more about the sub pack, you can always go to our show notes page, which where will they find, Brian? They'll find them at twit.tv slash kh, and you'll find previous episodes that you might want to check out. And if you haven't already, I suggest subscribing so you don't miss another episode of Knowledge. Exactly. And if you also don't want to miss every bit of homegrown knowledge, you're going to want to join our Google Plus community. Just go to Google Plus and look for know-how. Join up. It, there is a, uh, we, we have to approve 
your membership, but that was just to stop the spammers. So we let everybody through. <laughs> no, Again, you must prove your worthiness. Prove your worth. Yeah. Show he, us a project, and then you can. poorly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. No, but it is a great place for you to find new ideas for projects, to, to get techniques from people who have been doing it for a long time. Or if you are an expert builder, an expert maker, an expert DIYer, it's a place for you to share your knowledge with the upcoming generation of makers. Again, go to the Google Plus uh, uh, page and mm -hmm. just look for know-how. Of course, that's not the only place you're going to find us. No, no. If you want to keep up with us when we're not doing know-how or you want to ask us a question and just send us a direct message, the best way to do that is on Twitter. And I am at Cranky underscore Hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. And we have one more member of the community. His name is uh, Klaatu. He's our director. Klaatu, uh, Klaatu yes. is he's, he's quite good. He makes it's sure that good. we stay on time. And uh, I think you're pronouncing it wrong, though. Uh, I think, it, no, I'm pretty okay, sure it's, okay, it's Klaatu. Klaatu. Yeah. yeah, you're going to find him at Twitter.com. Excuse me, Padre, it's pronounced Alex. So close. No, I mean, no. Oh. I prefer Klaatu. So it's a different number of syllables. Find, find <laughs> Klaatu on Twitter. You're going to find him at Twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3. That's a Nelf 3. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go gaming. Isn't that what we talked about? <laughs> <laughs>